All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Absolute pleasure to be here. It's my second time in Bangalore this year, and uh, I have to say, like, the organizers have done a fantastic job. I see the ecosystem is growing, um, and so it's fantastic for us to, to see that happening because as an investment company, uh, we've invested in 200 companies worldwide now, about half of them from the U.S., and uh, we just started to invest in Indian companies. We just made our first investment a few months ago. The team is in Shenzhen with us at the moment, working on a health tech device, and uh, we're really looking forward to find uh, more opportunities. Uh, but to, uh, so I understand we have a really short time today, and uh, it's been a long day. It's already like 8 p.m. Uh, probably every, everybody uh, is uh, ready to, uh, to move a little bit. Uh, but uh, I'd like to take this chance to discuss with our panelists uh, about uh, what I consider being the the barriers to, to becoming a successful, successful company. And uh, I, I listed five, really. Uh, there's five barriers to become a successful hardware company. The first one is really to some, drum up the confidence to get started. The second one is building the first prototype. The third one is to turn that prototype into a product, something that comes out of the factory line. Then, when you're, you're not done, actually, even if you make the fantastic product, if nobody hears about it, it's not going to go anywhere. So launching a product is another thing you need to learn to do and do successfully. And after that, it's learning to scale. Because even if you have a fantastic launch, if, it, if you don't learn how to distribute, how to you know, build a, business, like a more regular repeat business, then you, you just have like a French souffle. Like if you wait too long, it just you know, falls down. Um, so uh, I'd like to turn to our panelists. And, uh, we, we have a really short time, so I, I think they heard you already, but maybe just for for reminding the people who are joining us. Um, Anand, if you can tell us about uh, what you do at Cardiac Design Labs. Very quickly, we, uh, we take advanced diagnostics to smaller hospitals. So we built a device, algorithms, and uh, the workflow on the cloud to make this happen. So you kind of distribute some of the hospital technology to like smaller hospitals or even places where there's no hospital. Is that correct? So what we've done is the existing technology used in large hospitals cannot be taken down to smaller hospitals. They, uh -huh. they need an infrastructure, trained technicians and cardiologists to function. So we've built something new that can actually work in a smaller setting by a mm. nurse. So there is a device which is built very differently and there's intelligent software that goes with it that Excellent. makes it function in a smaller hospital. Excellent. Okay, let's turn to our next panelist. Yes. So t tell us more about uh, what you do. Yeah. Uh, we have an IoT cloud platform that supports tag, track, and trace solutions for mm. the enterprises. Okay, and you have some, like some vertical specialties, I understand. Sorry? Like some vert industries that are your specialties. Yeah, we pretty right? much focus, uh, we started focusing on the logistics and uh, that's where it is. And now we are slowly expanding to another area outside the country mm -hmm. for the energy and uh, basically for the hospitality industry. Okay. Utilization of the, uh, of, of the machinery and things like that. Okay, excellent. These are the two areas, yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Harshit. I'm from Intugen Technologies. Uh, we are building very high quality motion and gesture control. And on top of that, we have a voice interaction. So we are kind of trying to define a new way of interaction using a wearable device, which is like a smart ring sitting on your finger. So the vision is mm. like one ring to rule them all. Okay. So that gives us kind of an overview of our, like where the companies are at. So you are basically doing pilots. You're already selling some units. Um, just kind of quickly summarizing. You're already on market with some solutions. And you're kind of advanced prototyping phase and about to get to market. So... Um, what would be kind of interesting to understand is uh, the ecosystem has changed so much that now you can do things faster than you used to, uh, but to get a sense of how long it took you to get to where you are, like, could you explain how easy was it to get started, uh, to find the first, uh, like, how long it took you to get to where you are, and uh, how did you build the first prototypes? What kind of resources uh, did you have access to? Okay, so uh, at the word go, our first requirement was not to be a Me Too company. So we could uh, fit very well into the system that had a certain need, but we were quite adamant to look uh, behind the screens of what a problem is. So we did spend significant time doing research to figure out what can be a better way of doing whatever they're doing today. Mm. But uh, once we got there... So you spent how long? Like a few weeks, a few months? No, a few months. We spent six months. I six, six months, months discussing months. with hospitals and, and practitioners? Doctors, yes. Okay. So, so that was the, the customer discovery. Correct. So, so to make sure you build something people want. 
So we were actually looking at for what the real problem is and how are they going about it today. And then we needed to understand what is the tech that was already built uh, that these people are using that mm. makes the solution possible today from looking at patients, that is, from our point of view. So it's really interesting because that's really an uncommon path for engineers. You started with the problem. Yes. You started spending time researching the problem instead of building a solution. And then yes. you look, started to look for the right sol technical Correct. solutions. And then how long did it take you to, to build your prototype? So what we did is, uh, with the set of problems that we found, I, I picked the ones that were most difficult mm -hmm. and would make the differentiator. We ended up putting a spec together for that and ended up building only exactly that. That involved a small piece of hardware, uh, some software that went in it, and a certain user aspect, which is the applications that went into it. So we picked out features that go all along, and built a complete skeletal system first, and then went about adding a little meat to it before we take it to and first. it's a medical device? Certified? Yes. Okay, so getting to market is generally quite long. Uh, to get the first pilots, did you need the certification to do the first deployments? No, we needed to do what is known as a, a proved patient safety. Okay. So we did certification, so what is known as a pre-certification, okay. so that the doctors know that using this device will not cause harm. Okay, it's that's a battery-operated device. It could now, how long did it take you to actually deploy the first kind of pre-certified device from the first day you started pro prototyping? Uh, it took us three years. So that's the problem. Because I had to say, like, so like what you described pr prior to your, your development is fantastic. It's exactly what founders should do, is making sure you have a real problem, making sure the technology is there, and then you can you know, invest more time. So you were very extensive in your research, but then three years to get to market. So obviously this is complicated because uh, uh, it's a you know, medical device, but even then, that sounds like kind of a long process. So let's, let's talk to our other panelists to see how, how that happened yeah. for them. I, I thought uh, Anand's is pretty, you know, investors will love his approach, finding the problem, look at the market. I, I contrary, I had started in a different way. Uh, in my previous organization, they found that they were building a point solution where, you know, they had challenges with scalability or, you know, even if the same customer had a different problem, they couldn't solve it. Mm -hmm. So I started with the how approach. So I built a platform. I said, if you have to really build an IoT solution mm -hmm. and you need to really, you know, the problems are going to be so many that within three months' time, you should come out with an end to an IoT solution. So I took a platform approach. Of course, uh, so, yeah. so actually, the difference is that how approach? You, looked for, you identified a problem, you researched it, and then you started to build a solution for clients, whereas cl you, were, you had a service company, and clients approached you with their problem, right. and then you started to see commonalities, solution. and then you build a product on top right. of that. So, and you could bankroll that probably with your, your service operations. Right. right? So, so you we, didn't we need currently a provide our investment. solutions as a software as a service and platform as a service. Mm -hmm. These are the two models by which we provide our, uh, that's our business model. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. How about you? What was your approach? So we started in college, uh, in, a, in, a, in a college year itself, and uh, we were seeing a lot of success in gesture control devices in a, uh, in, a, in a big screen play where you do gaming with a device like Kinect and Wii and Move. And we were seeing a trend where these technologies were shifting to small screens, phones or maybe mm -hmm. PCs, and we were seeing the, uh, the, the accuracy problem is not being solved. Most of these technologies were still very inaccurate to be implemented mm. in small screens. And that's when we started focusing on very high accuracy and precision way of controlling uh, these devices. And that's where we started off building a whole new framework of technology okay. for small screens. So you identified like a change in consumer equipment and you thought, okay, there's a brick missing. Um, I rem like three years, about three years ago, I came for the first time to India and I, I went around for about three weeks with a friend of mine and we met with a lot of startups uh, and uh, a lot of founders. And one thing they said is that, you know, startup founder is like at the very bottom of the social scale uh, because, you know, at the top is like a doctor, lawyer, politician, you have really stable job and very good status. Uh, beyond, below that is like businessman because, okay, you have less status, but you make money, so, you, you know, still okay. And below that is the, the startup guy because you make no money and you have no status. So they said it's actually a problem. Like you say, you know, we can't get married. It's really complicated. So how, how did you guys, I, I'm talking particularly to like the, the two youngsters we have here. Uh, how come your parents let you do that? Like what happened? How the, like, and, and that relates to the first barrier, which is confidence. And the confidence is about also facing the social environment you have, the economic environment, if there's opportunities with jobs or not. 
Uh, I personally believe that great startups and, and entrepreneurship happens mostly in two conditions. Either the economy is total shit and there's no job, and you're like, okay, well, if that don't create a job, there's no job. Or oh, the economy is like China, you know, it's growing very fast and people see a lot of opportunities, so they think, you know, I'll try that, and if I fail, there will be another opportunity tomorrow. It's not a problem. So, but the social environment also puts a lot of pressure. So, uh, particularly uh, when you have like lots of big companies hiring tons of engineers, providing great careers or opportunities in Silicon Valley. So, why do a startup? How do you like? Why do you think that's a good idea? <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, to begin with, I had a, I think, much bigger barrier because I was in the middle of the college and I dropped out of college to do this. So, I did not even complete the degree, and the parent pressure comes a lot when this, that is the case. So oh. they'll really uh, freak out in India if you are kind of dropping out in the middle of an IIT, uh, which people chase for four years and then get into the college. Uh, so I, I really had to build up a six month long story to convince them eventually that I'm going to go out and not going to continue this. Uh, for me, the decision was very much personal uh, because I did not see me fitting in a place where I don't see the bigger picture and I don't see my role in that bigger picture mm. uh, being played uh, in kind of a key way. And I think that was, to me, was very important. So it's about so being in charge yeah, and uh, yeah, in yeah, control yeah. of what you do. Yeah, and do uh, what something, something that really uh, makes a difference and you're kind of in charge in that. Mm. Uh, that that's something that's really, I think, common for people who well, like, decide to become entrepreneurs, that they want control and they want meaning. In, the, in their work, and uh, sometimes at the, some social cost or economic cost, <laughs> at least for some time. Uh, how about you, Anand? So I had a different problem. I, didn't, I, didn't, I was way into work. I had uh, the problem of the wife and a baby coming along. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's <laughs> so even, even a bigger problem, because you have economic constraints in addition yeah. to social constraints. Then. So, but I convinced her to work for some time. But then ah. midway she dropped So she, she's, your, she's your investor then, <laughs> essentially. But midway she said, I'm not doing this, and she got out as well. So oh. <laughs> wow. So doing algorithms all the way and attending cardiology classes for two and a half years, which I was mentioning, actually took the toll. Wow. No, you really went all in. And uh, in terms, of, so one thing, you know, there's just some, so we're, we're an investment company, but there's just so much we can do with our investments because there's you know, many more entrepreneurs that we can work with uh, and support effectively. Um, so for me, really, the key is to help people get that confidence, but I don't want blind confidence, like delusional confidence. I want the type of confidence you have, which is understand, like being dedicated to understand a problem, being persistent, uh, but also uh, identifying the right opportunities. And one of the keys for that, I believe, is to have examples of entrepreneurs around you that you can relate to. Uh, and not like the Steve Jobs of your country or whoever, uh, not somebody who's been very successful but years ago in a different way, somebody who is on already kind of successful but not too much, somebody who's like one, two, three steps ahead. Did you have anybody like, in, like this inspire you to, to get started or did you just look around on thought, okay, well, that's the only thing I can do, and uh, I'll do that. Like, did, what, what inspired you to start? Actually, an entrepreneur inspired me to quit my job. He walked in, and we had lunch at my earlier office where I work. He huh. said, as long as I work here, nothing is going to happen. He got me to quit within a week. So it, is, it was an entrepreneur who had exited you got, very, very well into selling his You got contaminated. <laughs> <laughs> right, so it was pretty so much Z like It's like said. the Zika virus. <laughs> uh, how about you? Yeah, I think I... I have someone as an example who is my senior, a couple of years senior in my college. So somebody college can easily relate to, yeah, yeah, same sorry. school, yeah. a few years apart. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, but not really in the product space. So there are a lot of things different there in a service space. Uh, mm -hmm. So as an entrepreneur, I can relate to him, but not really in the business sense. Uh, so I have that bit missing, I would say. Mm. In your case, you were already running a business, but I guess when you started, you also needed some inspiration. In my case, what happened, I had my first startup when I left Motorola in Singapore, and mm -hmm. it didn't go very well. So all my money, which I earned, got blown up. Wow. So I went and uh, took up a job in Saskin. I earned the money. I can, this is my second innings, and I have to make it successful. Otherwise, mm. my wife will chuck me out. So what did you do different? <laughs> Like yeah. What did you do different? What did you screw up with the first one and what, what oh, did you do right one, with the second? Uh, no, I was, uh, you know, we all, a uh, couple of us, team together and put uh, you know around 500,000 US dollars of our own money and built a beautiful facility and all of those things and tried. But the dot-com, actually the product idea was good. We trialed even in Japan, huh. the entity Docomo, but 
the dot com bust we didn't expect so that postponed the release of uh, 3g 3g ah, rollout okay. that uh, you were dependent on the badly. infrastructure yes so the entire Ouch. money got wiped out so we sold yeah. ourselves very cheaply to another company okay. which we uh, you know want to recover and uh, as venki is prompting me correctly there's a lot of support i'm getting from isa <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> and uh, yeah of course there's a lot of uh, excellent support that we got from iesa in terms of visibility in terms of uh, <coughs> free stalls mm. um, awards and things like that it really is helping me to uh, yep. keep keep going yeah like uh, um, i was discussing with the um, uh, the founder of uh, startex which is the, the incubator associated with uh, stanford in silicon valley and uh, he was studying under steve blank before he decided to start this and what before getting started with this accelerator, he wanted to identify what were the key things to be successful. So he went to talk to about 200 founders of companies from Stanford, some very successful, some not so much. And he tried to figure out what were the commonalities. And what he figured out is that the most networked people were the most successful. So it's always difficult to know if it's because they're successful than the network or the opposite. But uh, there's probably a strong correlation between how quickly you can find solutions and opportunities on how many people you know and, uh, and know you. Um, so like those networks are really massively important. So I think what's happening here today on the networks that are being built, built by the IoT Forum, uh, TIE, and uh, a lot of other organizations, on alumni networks and, and others are, are, are very important. And at Hacks, that's also something we try to do, creating our own alumni network with our 200 startups. That's about five, 600 founders that are all in hardware and all carefully selected. So it's almost like a little hardware university with alumni of different years. Um, and how are we doing on, on time? Do we have like a couple of minutes? We're kind of done? <laughs> okay. Okay, well, I guess, uh, I guess we're done. Um, maybe I'll just wrap up quickly. Um, let me see what I had some as for notes. Um, yeah, so maybe t as, a, as a kind of quick wrap up, um, I think it's important for people to understand that entrepreneurship is not just you know, gambling at a table. It's really a career with a skill set. And those skills you learn step by step. So uh, the, the strategy of what to do, the positioning of a company is really the number one because otherwise you might, you know, it's too random what you do. Um, and then learning not only how to build products, but how to make, how to make them, uh, how to produce them, how to launch them. So learning marketing skills, learning uh, production skills. So, in your particular case, what do you think is the next skill that's really important that you need to learn? And what's your plan for learning it? Okay, so in my case, uh, definitely, you know, we uh, started with how, so we spent some time in understanding the positioning part. We really got that now. Because you have a platform, yes, so it exactly. does everything. On exactly. That. So yeah. now we are really looking at some partnerships. That's where the key partnership, international level, that is mm -hmm. what is going to really help us. And we are really working hard on that to go outside and then how do I partner now? Okay, so you're trying companies. to learn from your customers how to position better right. your product. Okay, okay. so you, interesting. Yeah. How about you? I think the whole uh, positioning game we are still trying to understand for, for our product because it's really tough from that angle. Mm -hmm. uh, and and, and to, uh, just to understand the ground realities of how a business is run, and I think Venki keeps reminding me and the whole uh, Thai ISA team uh, keeps mentoring very strongly on that side, uh, that when you go on ground, there are multiple different things come in, the payments come in, you have to get right customers, you, ha you have to choose right customers, and choose right B2B partners. So mm -hmm. running the whole on-ground business, uh, as well as I think there's a lot of support in terms of how to position your product, and I think we have mm -hmm. been positioning it in multiple different ways from past uh, few, many months, we have, we have tried multiple mm. different approaches, and I think we have landed on few uh, through their support through in, in some of the very good approaches, which, mm. I, which I think really hit the customer at the right spot. So, uh, yeah, I think positioning okay. and, and the mm. whole on-ground business approach. Okay. I think in your case, the positioning is quite clear because you solved that first. <laughs> so what's, uh, what's your ne next task on the Deployment and happy customers. <laughs> Deployment and happy customers. Yeah, you know, customer support is the new marketing, right? So that's, uh, that's great. Um, so maybe as a wrap-up of the wrap-up, one last thing I'd, I'd like to mention uh, is that, so yes, entrepreneurship is, in the, is a career. Yes, it can bring you uh, meaning and, uh, and control of a, of a significant part of how you spend your life. Uh, but I would say beyond success and beyond building businesses, it has to be, to me, seen as a 
like it's, it's a vehicle, really. Uh, it's a vehicle to, for, for kind of self-realization. And I think, speaking in India, it's something that people can relate to. Like, a, there's almost something spiritual in about how you build a business and how you build a company and how you make meaning uh, through what you do. Uh, because if you do it right, it can make you feel alive every day in a meaningful way. So, thank you very much. Hey, thanks, Benji. Thanks a lot for staying back and uh, uh, enlightening the crowd on, on uh, the stuff that you spoke about. So, time to kind of give uh, uh, awards to the, to the Thai alumni. Uh, I think Anand's already got it, so let me skip that. Um, <laughs> thanks. thanks for coming. Thank you. And um, Som, can you kind of give this to Benji? Yeah. <laughs>